Welcome to Merely Catholic with me, Gavin Ashenden. The Catholic Herald is launching our renewed podcast in Holy Week, and as Catholics prepare to accompany our Lord on his journey to the cross, we have an interview with Father Patrick Policcino. Father Patrick is a priest in the Diocese of Southwark, but also he's a retired professor of neurology, and he's written an article exploring the implications of the Shroud of Turin for our understanding of what we read in the Gospels about the moment of Christ's death. In St John's Gospel, chapter 19, we're told that in order to make sure that death was beyond doubt, a soldier pierced Christ's side with a lance, and out flowed blood and water. Now this immediately catches our theological imagination, for the water reflects the experience of the Christian community in its understanding of baptism and the blood of the Eucharist mediating forgiveness. So we can understand this theologically, but it would be surprising if our curiosity didn't lead us to ask how such a profound, spiritually charged event might have come about practically. The Shroud of Turin shows that the body it contained had suffered a dislocated shoulder. One arm hangs ten centimetres lower down than the other. Drawing on his skills as a neurologist, Professor Policcino has written a scientific paper explaining what the implications of crucifying a man with a dislocated shoulder would be. Internal hemorrhaging would follow, brought on by the agonising attempts of the victim to draw breath. You'll hear Father Patrick's analysis in his own words and voice in a few moments, but what about the shroud itself? Is it really safe and sensible to base so much on a disputed relic? The Church, of course, has never officially made any pronouncements on the authenticity of the Shroud of Turin. Instead, it leaves it up to the intellectual curiosity and personal discernment of believers to assess the different kinds of examinations that have taken place. I found myself having to revisit the question of the reliability of the Shroud as we prepared for our conversation. I remembered there had been a carbon dating about 1988, which took place in three universities, and the results had posited a date between 1260 and 1390, suggesting that this was simply a medieval artefact. For many people, this was a definitive judgment, but it left many provocative problems unsolved. It didn't provide any explanation of how the image got there. It wasn't painted on, as you'd expect. The image rests only on the very top of the linen threads. No paint is soaked into the threads. In the late 1800s, as photography began to be developed, it became apparent the shroud had three-dimensional qualities and appears to act like a photographic negative. And then there was a second carbon dating test, and the results contradicted the first one. This new test by scientists at the University of Padua in northern Italy used the same fibres from the 1988 tests, but they came up with remarkably different results. These dated the shrouds between 300 BC and 400 AD, making it almost exactly contemporary with Christ. So how did the scientists explain these completely different results? It was thought that the early results might have been skewed by contamination from fibres used to repair the cloth when it was damaged by fire, as it was in the Middle Ages. Supporters point to additional evidence corroborating the earlier carbon dating. For example, there are no medieval examples of the herringbone stitch used to make the shard's linen in medieval Europe. You just don't find them. But you do find them in an earlier period in the Middle East. There are minute particles of dirt embedded in the shroud, especially around the nose, knees and feet, and these exactly match samples of dirt and stone found in other tombs in and around Jerusalem. The shroud also contains captured pollen spores, which when they're examined are identical to pollen produced by plants in the Jerusalem area, which bloom in March and April, as well as pollen that matches the route the shroud would have taken through Turkey, France and then Italy. So with conflicting evidence on both sides of the argument, each of us can weigh the possibilities as seems most convincing. But the additional discovery that the figure in the shroud suffered a severe dislocation of the shoulder, consistent with the injury that Jesus suffered as he fell, carrying the cross to Golgotha, will act as a telling corroboration for many. Beyond the intellectual task of assessing what the shroud is and where it came from, comes the spiritual implication of the suffering that it represents to us if it's authentic. For the Christian, that suffering is a testimony to the depth of God's love for us in embracing our humanity and being willing to become a sacrificial victim to win our forgiveness, and the invitation that so many followers of Jesus have experienced to share in his suffering and allow our gratitude to be deepened. And so we come to our conversation 
with Father Patrick. I want to welcome our guest today, Father Patrick Pulicino. Father Patrick is a scientist. He worked as a professor of neurology, and he's written a fascinating article for the Catholic Medical Quarterly to do with attention hemothorax being posited as a cause of Christ's effusion of blood. But one of the reasons we're coming to this today is because we're approaching Easter and all Catholics are contemplating the cross, contemplating the death of Christ and contemplating his resurrection. And in our culture, there's been this great separation between fact and value, between science and faith. Father Patrick brings to this whole issue a level of medical expertise. So, Father Patrick, welcome. Thank you very much for coming and joining us on this podcast. Thank you very much. Can I ask you, first of all, to tell us a little bit about yourself? There can't be very many secular priests who have earned their livings as a professor of neurology. Well, surprising, there, there are quite a few doctors among priests, but it's not always clear what they have done previously. Yes, I was and still am a neurologist and worked in the NHS. And this is I think probably the reason why I've been attracted to this particular issue, because I have been reading about the theories of the effusion of the blood and water from Christ after his body was lanced after his death. And none of them, to my mind, seemed to quite work out in terms of the pathophysiology of the body that I'd been accustomed to. So I'd been thinking about it over a couple of years. And also then I'd been interested in the shroud too. And the shroud gives us new insights into Christ's body after his death and tells us, particularly some Italian researchers, have made measurements on it. And it tells us a bit about what happened before his death. Now, not, not long ago, there was a radiocarbon dating exercise and it was publicized that it looked as though the fabric was essentially a medieval origin. And although no one could explain how such a sophisticated artifact could have been made, a lot of people said, look, it's failed its scientific test. It's clearly inauthentic. And so we have, we have a group of people saying you can't believe in the Gospels because we're entitled to be skeptical about these accounts. And another group who say you can't rely on the shroud because it's not authentic. I've always been very drawn to the Shroud, and the more I've read about it, the more I've been drawn to it. At what point did you decide that it, it was sufficiently authentic to command your attention as a scientist? Well, I think recently there has been a reviewing of the carbon dating and a looking at the actual pieces of material that were taken for carbon dating. And it transpires that some of the pieces that were taken were almost certainly taken from repairs to the shroud that were made in the Middle Ages. And those were carbon dated, it seems, to the Middle Ages. You know, I'm not an expert in carbon dating, but there is a, a separation of values. The values were not homogeneous, and some of them did relate back to Christ's time. And a review of the carbon dating that has been presented in, a few years ago shows that there is evidence that it does date back to Christ and that the so-called forgery part of it was only the part of the shroud that was repaired in the Middle Ages. But of course, that has been really pushed for all it's worth by people who wanted to discredit the shroud. And the shroud itself shows an extraordinary amount of detail. If they were forgers, they, which we don't think they were, they would have had to have known an enormous amount about anatomy and also about this form of, of death, the crucifixion. What led you to examine this theory of the dislocated shoulder, which took place when Christ fell, and, and the evidence for that in the shroud itself. Yes, the shoulder wound seems to be key, in my mind, to this effusion of blood and water. And part of it was reading about the shoulder wound of Christ when I was in seminary, and also finding out that Padre Pio was a great believer in the shroud, and also had a shoulder wound. Or, or pain in his shoulder. And so I reasoned that if there was a profound shoulder wound, as is suggested in the prayer of St. Bernard, that it could be seen on the shroud. But if you look at the shroud, it shows the shoulders quite reasonably, and there's no evidence of a deep wound 
on either side. I mean, you can see the you can see the wound of the lance, but you cannot see anything deep in the shoulder. And then at the same time, some Italian researchers, D. Lazzaro and others, started to make measurements on the shroud, and they produced some very interesting findings about the right arm. They found, first of all, that the right arm bone or the humerus was displaced down below the shoulder about three and a half centimeters. Then if you look at the lowest extent of the arms, the right arm fingertips come right up to the lateral border of the left thigh, whereas the left arm fingertips are about 10 centimeters further in. So there's a clear discrepancy in the lowest extent of the arms. And de Lazaro put this together with other findings on the upper back, showing that almost certainly bruises from where the cross was carried. They showed that the, there are abrasions on both shoulders, not just one. So the cross is carried on both sides. And not only that, on the left side, the abrasions are lower down. So he was in more of a stooped posture. And all this is revealed on the shroud. So we have a shoulder wound. We have the cross transferred to the left side. Then further inferences they make from this was that he must have had a severe dislocation of the right shoulder. And this was the shoulder wound. And accompanying that dislocation, they say the right arm became useless. And that is why they had to transfer the, the cross to the left shoulder. And they postulate that it was a brachial plexus avulsion that occurred, that it was such a severe dislocation and that the cross hit him on the back of the neck and tore all the nerves to the right arm. You've looked at the anatomical implications of this and and you have worked out how it might be that a gathering of blood and a gathering of a fluid might have accumulated at just the point where the centurion pierced Christ's body with a spear. Can you, for layman, explain how you came to that conclusion and what, how the mechanics of that work in a, in a dying body? Well, the only thing in medicine that is similar to blood spurting out from a chest when it is punctured is what is called a tension hemothorax. And this actually is a known phenomenon when blood is under pressure in the thorax and you put in a cannula to try and decompress it, the blood will actually spurt out because it, the blood fills the cavity and it's under arterial pressure. So working back from that, it seemed he could well have had a tension hemothorax. The question is, how did he get the tension hemothorax? He would have had to have an arterial source of bleeding that was ongoing. What it appeared to me was that his right arm being so stretched when he was crucified, that the right subclavian artery, which is the main artery from the heart to the right arm, was also stretched. It would have to have been stretched. The bone that it goes over, there is one bone that when it the artery exits the chest cavity, it's the first rib. And what I think could have happened, and this is only a hypothesis, was that in breathing movements, and this has been looked into by other people who, who show that breathing on the cross is extremely difficult. And to exhale, the victim has to push up on his feet. And to inhale, he lets his weight sink down. And so the body, there's a to and fro, up and down motion going on just to survive. And so with that arm and the artery stretched over the first rib, I can imagine that that artery was seesawing across that bone. After three hours of that, it is not inconceivable that that artery just gave way. So you'd have got a torrential bleeding into the chest cavity, which would be unstoppable. And in cases that have occurred in humans from an aneurysm bursting at that site, which there is a case that I, I quote, the chest can take up to... 40% of the whole blood volume of a man. So effectively, if this happened to Christ, his blood would have just been poured out totally into his chest cavity. It wouldn't be seen externally, but his blood was still being poured out till effectively no more blood could be poured out. <laughs> 
there have been instances where this has led to death. So I think it's not inconceivable that this could have happened. And of course it has the most profound theological and sacramental implications as well as as well as simply being the result of a, of a physical process you can describe. What about the fluid? What about the water? Well, the water is slightly more conjectural, but I did some research into individuals that have had severe brachial plexus lesions, and what actually happens then is the, the nerves in the neck are actually surrounded by a sheath of cerebrospinal fluid. And after the blood volume, the biggest volume we have of fluid in the body is the cerebrospinal fluid. It's about 175 mils of fluid over the brain and down the spinal cord. And it's crystal clear like water and 99% water. After an injury to the brachial plexus, this is torn and fluid starts to leak into the area around the tear. This report that I quote by a group from, I think it's the Mayo Clinic, basically show that you can accumulate quite a volume of cerebrospinal fluid just on the outside of the, the lung. And it appears to be like what's called a pleural effusion, but it is in fact an effusion of cerebrospinal fluid. If that did happen, it would be right at the top of the lung in the direction of a lance that was pushed in from below. So the theory here is that not only did the chest cavity get punctured, but this cerebrospinal fluid collection got punctured and that it was that that produced the water flow with the blood. Not everyone will know about the conversations that St. Bernard had with the risen Christ or, or indeed about Padre Pio's devotion to the shroud and the, and the shoulder injury. Is that how you found your way spiritually to a deeper significance of this? Was that, was that corroborative material held in the church's memory part of the stimulus for you turning your attention medically to this? Yes, definitely. St. Bernard, for those that don't know about it, St. Bernard used to have visions of our Lord and he once asked him what was the most painful wound of the passion that people did not know about. He records Christ's, Jesus' answer, saying that the, he had a shoulder wound that people were not aware of, but it caused him the most suffering. So it was a very painful wound. And he, he also went on to say that anybody who honored this wound would have all their venial sins and all mortal sins taken away. So it has a lot of spiritual power, the shoulder wound. In fact, tearing of the brachial plexus produces a pain which is known as causalgia, and it is the most severe pain known to man. People who have had this some of them attempt suicide because the pain is so bad. And one of the descriptions that I quoted in another paper was a woman who said it's like your arm being boiled in oil and that she said she didn't know people were able to feel such severe pain. So it was a very severe pain. And then Padre Pio had a devotion to the shoulder wound. There is um, a story as well of one of his monks who after his death, who knew about this wound, asked Padre Pio if it was really true. This is after Padre Pio died. And this monk woke up in the middle of the night with this terrible shoulder pain. He heard a voice saying, this is what I had to experience. And this is Padre Pio showing him that the wound really was real and, and that this is what he experienced. It's, it's quite difficult moving from the very gruesome details of, of human suffering and a broken body on the cross to the furniture of our spiritual life. But as a, as a baptised Christian and as a priest and as you come to prepare for Good Friday yourself, what does this insight, this medical insight, the mechanics, the, the affirmation of the facts, how do they affect you and your, your prayer life and your devotion as you prepare for this great festival? Well, I think there's a couple of ways. First of all, our Lord has always insisted that his blood was poured out on the cross. And we've used this figuratively, but if this is true, his blood was actually literally poured out to as far as it could go. Uh, so it does connect us more closely with, with the pouring out of his blood. Secondly, the issue about the right arm being rendered ineffectual, I think also has some spiritual 
ramifications because the right arm is the right arm of God, is the is the arm of his power. And it is the arm that Jesus used to cure with, that he used to touch people with. So really losing his right arm power was probably as bad an injury spiritually as could have been made on him because his whole ability to to heal had now gone from his arm point of view. So I think that's another thing that, that makes this a very profound injury. And also that from what our Lord said, there is great hidden spiritual power for those who wish to honor this wound and for those who wish to honor him for bearing this wound. And I think very little has been done about that. I think this is now 2,000 years after the Passion and after this terrible wound was inflicted, and it was the most painful wound. And I think the time has come really to give honor to our Lord for this and to set up prayers, even groups who would pray. I mean, there, there are other parts of the Passion that have even engendered the setting up of of orders, I think the shoulder wound really needs to be brought out. And we somehow need to give our Lord his true due for bearing this, this terrible spiritual and painful wound. Professor Pulicino, Father Patrick, thank you very much for joining us on this Catholic Herald podcast. Thank you for what you've done to help us honour the wound and prepare for this great festival of love and praise. Bless you and thank you very much. Thank you.